Abraham Lincoln, Misery's Child Review of Abraham Lincoln, A Life, by Michael Burlingame The Atlantic, July-August, 2009 Lincoln's Bicentennial has permitted us to revisit and reconsider every facet of his story and personality. From the Bismarckian big government colossus, so disliked by the traditional right and the isolationists, to the great emancipator, who used to figure on the posters of the American Communist Party, to the reluctant anti-slaver so plausibly caught in Gore Vidal's finest novel. Absent from much of this consideration has been the unfashionable word destiny, the sense conveyed by Lincoln of a man who was somehow brought forth by the hour itself, as if his entire life had been but a preparation for that moment. We cannot get this frisson from other great American presidents. Washington, Jefferson, Madison, these were all experienced members of the existing and indeed pre-existing governing class. So was Roosevelt. However exaggerated or invented some parts of the Lincoln legend may be, it is nonetheless a fact that he came from the very loam and marrow of the new country, and that, unlike the other men I've mentioned, he cannot possibly be imagined as other than an American. No review could do complete justice to the magnificent two-volume biography that has been so well wrought by Michael Burlingame. But one way of paying tribute to it is to say that it introduces the elusive idea of destiny from the very start. And one means of illustrating this is to show how the earlier chapters continually prefigure or body forth the more momentous events that are to be dealt with in the later ones. Before I try to demonstrate that, I would like to call attention to something that Professor Burlingame says in his author's note. Many educated guesses, informed by over 20 years of research on Lincoln, appear in this biography. Each such guess might well begin with the phrase like, in all probability, or it may well be that, or it seems likely that. Such warnings, if inserted into the text, would prove wearisome. Readers are encouraged to provide such qualifiers silently whenever the narrative explores Lincoln's unconscious motivation. It is agreeable to be informed when embarking on such a long and demanding work that one will be treated like a grown-up. There is, whether intentionally or not, a sort of biblical cadence and flavour to the way in which Burlingame relates the early family history. The grandmother Bathsheba, the father's older brother Mordecai, and Mary Lincoln's half-sister, who said that the reason why Thomas Lincoln grew up unlettered was that his brother Mordecai, having all the land in his possession, turned Thomas out of the house when the latter was twelve years, so he went out among his relations. The story of Jacob and Esau, and of Naboth's vineyard, was surely known to the person who recounted that. As for the social background, here's a sentence that conveys a great deal of misery in a very few words. It is Burlingame's summary of the area in which Sinking Spring Farm, Kentucky, young Abraham's birthplace, was situated. The neighborhood was thinly settled. The 36-square-mile tax district where the Lincoln Farm was located contained 85 taxpayers, 44 slaves, and 392 horses. Lincoln himself said that his early life could be condensed into a single sentence from Gray's Elegy, the short and simple annals of the poor. But this would be to euphemize his true boyhood situation, which was much more like that of a serf or a domestic animal than of Gray's lowly but sturdy peasantry. To read of the unrelenting coarseness and brutality of the boy's father is lowering to the spirit as is the shame he felt at his mother's reputation for unchastity. The wretchedness of these surroundings made Lincoln tell a later acquaintance in Illinois, I have seen a good deal of the backside of this world. Incidentally, one has to imagine this being said with some kind of wink and nudge. Burlingame is not content, as so many historians are, merely to hint at Lincoln's fondness for broad humour, but furnishes us with some actual examples which are heavy on the side of scatology and flatulence. Lincoln's own experience of legal bondage and hard usage is very graphically told. Not only did his father's improvidence deprive him of many necessities, 
but it resulted in his being hired out as a menial to be a hewer of wood and drawer of water for his father's rough and miserly neighbours. The law, as it then stood, made children the property of their father, so young Abraham was hired out only in the sense of chattel, since he was obliged to turn over his wages. From this, and from the many groans and sighs that are reported of the boy, who still struggled to keep reading, an activity feared and despised by his father, as it was by the owner of Frederick Douglass, we receive a prefiguration of the politician who declared in 1856, I used to be a slave. In Lincoln's unconcealed resentment toward his male parent, we get an additional glimpse of the man who also declared in 1858, As I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. Yet the contours and character of the frontier region also fitted Lincoln for compromise. This was the area of the United States where the two systems were beginning their long, cruel attrition. Both as an aspiring congressman and as an ambitious lawyer, Lincoln managed on occasion to keep silent on the slavery issue and even, when appropriately briefed, to act as counsel for a slaveholder. Burlingame gives an intriguing account of the Matson case of 1847, in which on technical procedural grounds and on the principle of first come, first served, Lincoln agreed to represent a man who wanted some of his slaves back. On the other hand, he generally steered clear of fugitive slave cases. Because of his unwillingness to be a party to a violation of the fugitive slave law, arguing that the way to overcome the difficulty was to repeal the law. Here again, we can see the legalistic and sometimes pedantic mind that exhausted all the possibilities of compromise before coming up with the tortuous form of words that finally became the Emancipation Proclamation. In rather the same way, Lincoln sought a deft means of negotiating the shoals of the religious question. Burlingame's highly diverting early pages show Lincoln being actively satirical in matters of faith, lampooning preachers, staging mock services, and praying to God to put stockings on the chicken's feet in winter, in the words of his stepsister Matilda. Reminiscing about frontier Baptists many years later, he told an acquaintance, I don't like to hear cut-and-dried sermons. No, when I hear a man preach, I like to see him act as if he were fighting bees. However, in his 1846 election campaign, Lincoln was cornered by the faithful and forced to deny that he was an open scoffer at Christianity. His handbill on the subject is rightly criticised as too lawyerly by Burlingame, who elegantly points out, In this document, Lincoln seemed to make two different claims, that he never believed in infidel doctrines and that he never publicly espoused them. If the former were true, the latter would be superfluous. If the former were untrue, the latter would be irrelevant. Several moments in the narrative, the bee-fighting preacher being one of them, put me in mind of Mark Twain. The tall tales, the dry wit, the broad-gauge humour, the imminence of farce even in grave enterprises. Lincoln's inglorious participation in the Black Hawk War has many points of similarity with Twain's private history of a campaign that failed. Lincoln was once invited to referee a cockfight where a bird refused combat. Its enraged owner, one Bab McNabb, flung the creature onto a woodpile, whereat it spread its feathers and crowed mightily. Yes, you little cuss, yelled McNabb. You're great on dress parade, but you ain't worth a damn in a fight. Long afterward, confronted with the unmarshaled ditherings of General George B. McClellan, Lincoln would compare the chief of his army and subsequent electoral challenger to McNabb's pusillanimous rooster. Mark Twain and Frederick Douglass, too, were persons who could only have been original Americans, sprung from American ground. It's engaging and affecting to read of Lincoln's lifelong troubles with spelling and pronunciation. He addressed himself to Mr. Cheerman in his famous Cooper Union speech of 1860, and of his frequent appearance with as much as six inches of shin or arm protruding from his ill-made clothes. Truly, a knight of the sorrowful countenance. Yet despite, or perhaps because of, the extreme harshness of his early life, 
he was innately opposed to any form of cruelty, and despite his lack of polish and refinement, he almost never stooped to crudity or vulgarity in political speech. Without overdrawing the contrast, Burlingame shows us a Judge Stephen Douglas, who was a slave to every kind of anti-Negro demagogy and political mendacity, and Lincoln bested him, admittedly while hedging on the race question, by constantly stressing the need to secure to each labourer the whole product of his labour. In more modern terms, we might say that he used the language of class to neutralise racism. I would say that the account given here of the famous debates surpasses all its predecessors. It has lately become fashionable to say that Lincoln was not, or was not, really a believer in black-white equality. A thread that runs consistently through Burlingame's narrative is that of self-education on this question, to the eventual point where Lincoln came as close to an egalitarian position as made almost no difference. Even the infamous discussion about the post-war expatriation of black Americans to colonies in Africa or on the American Isthmus was conducted, by Burlingame's account, with very strict regard on Lincoln's side for the dignity and stature of those whose fate he was discussing. And it goes almost without saying that he had already had every opportunity to see that there was nothing very superior about the colour white. By the end, Frederick Douglass, who had often criticised him, was able to say that Lincoln was emphatically the black man's president. And Burlingame's survey of the life and opinions of the mad racist John Wilkes Booth makes it equally plain that the white supremacists felt the same way. Still, even this is to understate the universalist intransigence with which Lincoln never conceded an inch of American ground, and with which he quarrelled with his generals, including McClellan, for referring to the North as our soil, when every state was still always and invariably to be considered a part of the Union. It was once said that the Civil War was the last of the old wars and the first of the new. Cavalry and infantry charges gave way to cannon and railways, and sail gave way to steam. It is of great interest to read Lincoln's meditations on the projected post-war expansion of the United States with a strong emphasis on mining and manufacturing. He had completely shared the bucolic influence of his early career and was looking in the very last days of his life to renew industry and immigration. Before Gettysburg, people would say, the United States are. After Gettysburg, they began to say, the United States is. That they were to employ the first three words at all was a tribute to the man who did more than anyone to make that hard transition himself, and then to secure it for others, and for posterity. Mark Twain, American Radical Review of the Singular Mark Twain by Fred Kaplan The Atlantic, November 2003 There are four rules governing literary art in the domain of biography. Some say five. In the Singular Mark Twain, Fred Kaplan violates all five of them. These five require 1 that a biography shall cause us to wish we had known its subject in person and inspire in us a desire to improve on such vicarious acquaintance as we possess. The singular Mark Twain arouses in the reader an urgently fugitive instinct as at the approach of an unpolished yet tenacious raconteur. 2. That the elements of biography make a distinction between the essential and the inessential winnowing the quotidian and burnishing those moments of glory and elevation that place a human life in the first rank. The singular Mark Twain puts all events and conversations on the same footing and fails to enforce any distinction between wood and trees. 3. That a biographer furnish something by way of context so that the place of the subject within history and society is illuminated and his progress through life made intelligible by reference to his times. This condition is by no means met in the singular Mark Twain. 4. That the private person be allowed to appear in all his idiosyncrasy and not as a mere reflection of the correspondence or reminiscences of others, or as a subjective projection of the mind of the biographer, 
but this rule is flung down and danced upon in the singular Mark Twain. 5. That a biographer have some conception of his subject, which he wishes to advance or defend against prevailing or even erroneous interpretations. This detail, too, has been overlooked in the singular Mark Twain. As can readily be seen from this attempt on my part at a pastiche of Twain's hatchet-wielding arraignment of James Fenimore Cooper and of Cooper's anti-masterpiece The Deerslayer, the work of Samuel Langhorne Clemens is in the proper sense inimitable. But it owes this quality to certain irrepressible elements, many of them quite noir, in the makeup of the man himself. I reflect on Mark Twain, and I see not just the man who gave us Judge Thatcher's fetching daughter, but also the figure who wrote so cunningly about the charm of underage girls, and so bluntly about defloration. The man who impaled the founder of Christian science on a stake of contemptuous ridicule, and who dismissed the Book of Mormon as chloroform in print. The man who was so livid with anger at his country's arrogance abroad, that he laid aside his work to inveigh against imperialism. The man who addressed an after-dinner gathering of the Stomach Club in Paris on the subject of masturbation, and demonstrated that he had done the hard thinking about hand jobs. Flickers of this enormous and subversive personality illumine Kaplan's narrative, but only rarely, and then in the manner of the lightning bug that Twain himself contrasted with the lightning. Ernest Hemingway's much-cited truism, to the effect that Huckleberry Finn hadn't been transcended by any subsequent American writer, understated, if anything, the extent to which Twain was not just a founding author, but a founding American. Until his appearance, even writers as adventurous as Hawthorne and Melville would have been gratified to receive the praise of a comparison to Walter Scott. A boat named Walter Scott is sunk with some ignominy in Chapter 13 of Huckleberry Finn. Twain originated in the riverine slaveholding heartland, compromised almost as much as Missouri itself when it came to the Civil War, headed out to California, the Lincoln of our literature made a name in the state that Lincoln always hoped to see and never did, and conquered the eastern seaboard in his own sweet time. But though he had an unimpeachable claim to be from native ground, there was nothing provincial or crabbed about his declaration of independence for American letters. His evisceration of Cooper can be read as an assault on any form of pseudo-native authenticity. More than most of his countrymen, he voyaged around the world and pitted himself against non-American authors of equivalent contemporary weight. 